In his prime, nearly every game was its own highlight reel, filled with high-flying dunks, acrobatic layups, and huge rejections. And a few of these would always end in the same way, with Gerald Wallace crashing to the floor. He knew what kind of player he was and what he had to offer, and excelled in those areas. He wasn't a shot creator or a knockdown shooter, but in his prime, he had the athleticism and quickness to slash to the rim with ease while having the body control to convert inside. But that's not to say he was incapable of hitting an outside shot, as you still didn't want to leave him open. But where he made his money was on the defensive end, with an endless motor and complete disregard for his body. He put in maximum effort every possession to become one of the most versatile players of his generation, while racking up steals and putting up impressive block and rebound numbers for someone his size. And he wasn't afraid of the dirty work down low or standing in to take a charge. But most importantly, he gave Charlotte Bobcats fans something to cheer for in their early existence. It's a shame his best years were wasted on a bad team, but it forced him to push himself and maximize his production after his first few years were spent buried on the bench. He unfortunately couldn't find his fit in the back end of his career, which likely didn't end how he would have expected. And even though he never played a full season and was often suffering from some sort of injury, it's impressive how many games he did play with the way he abused his body on the court. And on top of that, if Gerald Wallace was playing, you knew he was going to give you everything and wouldn't be long before he gave you an example of why his nickname was Crash. And careers like his are ones that aren't told by the numbers only. So today's episode is going to reflect on the complete player he was. Let's jog your memory. An Alabama native, Gerald Wallace attended Childersburg High School, where he had a dominant career which culminated in him being named a McDonald's All-American as well as a first team parade All-American, while being voted Naismith Prep Player of the Year and Alabama's Mr. Basketball, on top of being named to the state All-Star team. And according to former NFL All-Pro Justin Tuck, Wallace earned his place among the nation's best by always being a guy that works on his craft to improve his game. But it definitely helped that he was almost always the biggest and most athletic guy on the court. Wallace flirted with the idea of going straight to the pros from high school as he had the talent and was a top five prospect in the nation. But he would instead choose to attend the University of Alabama as he would say that he felt he was ready coming out of high school, but also that he needed the experience of playing against guys better than him. Wallace saw a much lesser role than he had in high school during his 01 freshman season. The Crimson Tide were a young team, as their starting lineup featured four sophomores. But Wallace wasn't a sophomore, so that must mean he wasn't a starter. And that's true. Wallace played an important role, but it was coming off the bench as a sixth man. Although he would play the fourth highest minutes on the team, it was likely less than he was used to, but he would still make the most of it. He would be fourth on the team in scoring, third in rebounding, second in blocks, and first in steals. Alabama started the year off 9-0, but would then go just 11-9 the rest of the way, including 8-8 eight eight in conference play. They finished the regular season with four straight losses and went into the SEC tournament with a 20-9 record. They would defeat Vanderbilt in the first round, but lose to Florida in the quarterfinals. And the Crimson Tide would not receive a tournament berth, but they were invited to the NIT, where they would reach the final, but lose to Tulsa. But that was the end of a freshman season that saw Wallace put up about 10 points, 6 rebounds, one and a half assists, one steal, and a block per game. But after his one year at Alabama, Wallace elected to put his name into the 2001 NBA draft, where he was confident that he would be a first round pick. But he also knew that he needed to wow teams at his pre-draft workouts, as he felt that being used as a power forward during his lone year at Alabama didn't allow him to showcase his full ability. And although it was late in the first round, Wallace would hear his name called on pick 25, when he was selected by the Sacramento Kings. The Kings featured guys like Chris Webber, Peja Stojakovic, Vlade Divac, and Doug Christie. But the acquisition of Wallace wasn't even the highlight of the Kings draft day, as they had also pulled off a trade which saw them send fan favorite Jason Williams to the Grizzlies for Mike Bibby, which completed their greatest show on court offense. Wallace would have a minimal role during his time in Sacramento, but was still providing good energy off the bench, as he was part of a great bench unit featuring guys like Bobby Jackson and Hito Turkoglu. In his first season as a pro, Wallace appeared in just 54 games, receiving only 8 minutes per game, as it was difficult for him to find his place. He was the size of a shooting guard or small forward, but didn't have the shooting range that was so crucial in this Kings offense. But the power forward was occupied by one of the league's best in Chris Webber. However, one thing that was certain was that Wallace was the best athlete on the team, and one of the best in the league as he would compete in the dunk contest where he would finish as a runner-up to Jason Richardson. And I just gotta stop to take a minute here and appreciate what the dunk contest used to be. Not only with the player's creativity, 
but even with the leagues, as the wheel spin to determine what kind of dunk to do was a pretty cool touch. Wallace's best game of the season would come on December 16th, when he put up 20 points on 9 of 16 shooting while pulling down 9 rebounds and recording 3 steals. But the Kings as a whole were elite. They finished the year with the league's best record at 61-21 and, and began the playoffs with a matchup versus Utah. Wallace would have an almost non-existent role during the playoffs as he would not appear in the Kings 4 game first round series win. The second round brought Dallas, and Wallace would make his first appearance in garbage time of a game 1 blowout win, then would see the court briefly in games 3, 4, and 5 after Stoyakovich went down with an ankle injury. The Kings advanced in 5 games and would play the Lakers in the conference finals. And although this series is one of the most controversial in NBA history, Wallace didn't really play a role, as he recorded two points and a block in five minutes of action in Game 1, before sitting the rest of the series in what ended up being a seven-game Kings loss. But Wallace's rookie year ended with him averaging about three points, one and a half rebounds, and half a steal per game. 2003 saw the Kings return basically the same roster, which meant another year of Wallace being very deep on the bench. His minutes did increase by over 33%, and he started 7 games, but he only appeared in 47 games. However, he showed improvement across the board, and his per 36 minutes continued to be very respectable. So it was clear that he was capable, he was just on a great team who didn't really need his contributions. This season would see him record another 20 point game, when he had 21 points and 8 rebounds in a December 1st win versus Houston, and he would also record 2 double doubles on the year. The Kings would return to the playoffs with a 59-23 and record, and get a first round rematch with Utah. Wallace would again mostly see the court in garbage time, as he appeared in games 2, 4, and 5, which were all Kings blowout wins. Round 2 brought Dallas, and the Kings won game 1, with Wallace again getting garbage time minutes. He would play his most in game 2, with just over 8 minutes, but this was due to circumstances the Kings did not want. Weber tore his ACL in the third quarter of a Mavs blowout win, and would be lost for the rest of the playoffs. The Kings were able to push the series to 7 games, but would lose Game 7 in a blowout. Even with Weber out, Wallace continued getting just garbage minutes, as he only appeared in 2 more games for a total of 1 minute and 17 seconds, and his season ended with him averaging about 4.5 points, 2.5 rebounds, and half a steal per game. Going into 2004, the Kings had shipped away Turk Lou as part of a deal which saw them acquire all-star center Brad Miller from the Pacers. But even with the Kings being without Weber for the majority of the year, as well as losing Bobby Jackson for a huge chunk, Wallace would see a dip in his minutes, and in turn his numbers. But he would be responsible for one of the wildest media day pictures of all time. He would appear in just 37 games while putting up career lows in points and field goal percentage, as his per 36 had gone way down, and his best play of the season, and maybe his time with the Kings, didn't even occur in the regular season. Instead it was a huge dunk over Houston's Boston Knockbar in the preseason. Wallace would only crack double figures in two games and record just one double-double, when he had 16 and 11 versus Dallas on Christmas Day. Even dealing with injuries, the Kings were still a top team, as they were 44 and 15 at the time of Weber's return and would finish the year at 55 and 27, and would get the Mavs in round one of the playoffs. Once again, Wallace barely saw the court. He made a brief appearance in garbage time of games one and three, as the Kings won in five games, and round two brought the T-Wolves. And as this was a close series, Wallace only saw a brief action in a Game 5 loss, as the Kings would lose the series in 7. And for the regular season, Wallace put up about 2 points, 2 rebounds, and half a steal per game. So the season was over, but there was a new team joining the league going into the 2005 season. And like any team, they need new players, who they acquire through the expansion draft. And Wallace was left unprotected by Sacramento. So Wallace was one of 19 players selected in the 2004 expansion draft, and in looking at the other players, he was by far the best. The Bobcats would also have the second pick in the rookie draft, and would select UConn big man Emeka Okafor. So the Bobcats were just an expansion team trying to find their footing, but getting Wallace and Okafor gave them a defensive presence on the perimeter and in the paint. Wallace would finally get the minutes he needed to prove himself, playing 70 games and receiving over 30 minutes per game. He had upped his scoring to over 11 points, would be the team's third leading rebounder, but where he excelled was through his versatility on the defensive end, as he finished second on the team in steals and blocks, and was adept at taking charges, which don't show up on the stat sheet. As a starter, Wallace would have 51 games in double figures and crack 20 points six times, while recording seven double doubles. Additionally, he would have six games with at least four steals and five games with at least four blocks, 
but naturally an expansion team is not going to be good. And the Bobcats under Bernie Bickerstaff went 18 and 64 in year one. But Wallace's first year as a starter saw him average about 11 points, five and a half rebounds, one and a half steals, and one and a half blocks per game. 2006 would be one of the best and most underrated seasons of Wallace's career. The Bobcats looked the same, but had drafted North Carolina's Raymond Felton and Sean May. However, the reigning rookie of the year in Okafor would only play in 26 games, as an ankle injury, which he originally suffered as a rookie, kept lingering this year. The Bobcats would improve, but would still only manage a 26 and 56 record. But going back to Wallace, along with playing on a bad, small market team, a big reason why this season was so underrated was because he missed a lot of it, as he really started seeing the effect that his playstyle had on his body. He would miss some time early in the year with a concussion, which would be one of many he'd suffered in his career, then would miss over a month of action after a knee injury in late January, as overall he would play just 55 games this year. But in those 55 games, he'd be great. On the offensive end, he would lead the team in scoring while finishing second in rebounding behind Okafor. He would shoot a career-high 53.8% from the field, which would be good for fourth in the league. Then on the defensive end, he would finish with the 14th best defensive rating in the league, while leading the Bobcats in steals and blocks. His 2.5 steals per game would be the best in the league, and his 2.1 blocks per game would be 11. And he would join Hakeem Olajuwon and David Robinson as the only players in NBA history to average two steals and two blocks in a season. And he did this as a six foot seven wing. He would record 10 double doubles this year and erupt for 41 points on 17 of 22 shooting in a March 28th win versus Atlanta. He would also have 14 games with at least four steals including a career-high 8 steals to go along with 21 points and 15 rebounds in a January 13th loss to Milwaukee. And he would also have 10 games with at least 4 blocks, including a career-high 6 blocks in a January 16th loss to New Orleans. But overall for his regular season, he would average about 15 points, 7.5 rebounds, 2.5 steals, and 2 blocks per game. The 2006 draft saw the Bobcats pick up the next Larry Bird who was going to be a franchise legend. Uh, just, just kidding, it's uh, just Adam Morrison. Okafor would come back relatively healthy for 07, and him along with Felton and Wallace would be the team's top three scorers. But Wallace was further separating himself as the team's top player. He had a much healthier year as he appeared in 72 games and would up his scoring nearly three points, yet would continue to shoot over 50% from the field and would again be the team's second best rebounder. His blocks dropped to one per game, but he continued to average two steals per game to lead the team and finish fourth in the league, as he would finish seventh in Defensive Player of the Year voting. He would have 13 games with at least four steals this year, but his bigger improvements came on the offensive end, as he would hit double figures in 60 games, have two games with at least 40, and drop his career high of 42 points on 14 of 22 shooting to go along with eight rebounds and three blocks in a January 31st win versus New York. Additionally, he would record 16 double-doubles on the year, and the Bobcats were continuing to show gradual improvement, but their 33-49 record was still not enough for a playoff berth. And for the regular season, Wallace put up about 18 points, 7 rebounds, 2 steals, and a block per game. Going into 2008, the Bobcats had a new coach in Sam Vincent, and they were finally able to bring in a big-name player when they traded for the Warriors' Jason Richardson during the offseason. Additionally, they had re-signed Wallace to a six-year, $57 million deal. Felton, Okafor, and Richardson each played 79 games or more, but Wallace would only manage 62, partially due to a sprained ankle he suffered in February. But he would also miss one game early in the year, stemming from an awkward fall that occurred when he hit his head on the backboard a couple games earlier, which was the first of two head injuries, as he suffered a grade three concussion in late February which kept him out of the next eight games, as this was his fourth concussion in as many seasons. Nonetheless, Richardson and Wallace would be a one-two punch for the Bobcats, as they combined for over 41 points per game, with Wallace averaging a career-high 19.4 points, as he would also finish second on the team in rebounds and first in steals, which was good for fifth in the league. His shooting percentage dropped, but this was in part due to him shooting significantly more threes than ever before, as his 221 attempts was over 100 more than any season prior. Wallace would have 56 games in double figures and 9 double doubles, while also recording 10 games with at least 4 steals. But for the first time in their existence, the Bobcats wouldn't improve, as they finished with one less win than the last season at 32-50. and 50. And although they recorded a franchise best 5 game winning streak this year, they had two separate 7 game losing streaks, as the playoffs still eluded them. But for the regular season, 
Wallace put up about 19 and a half points, a career high 3.5 assists, two steals, and a block per game. Charlotte welcomed their third coach in as many years, as Larry Brown would lead the team going into the 09 season. They started the year looking the same, but elected to go for more depth when they traded a package headlined by Richardson to Phoenix for a package including players like Raja Bell and Boris Diaw early in the year on December 10th. With the addition of Bell on the wing opposite Wallace and Okafor in the paint, the Bobcats boasted the 9th best scoring defense in the league, and Wallace finished with the 12th best defensive rating in the league, and he would put up his 4th straight season finishing top 10 in steals, as his 1.7 per game was 6th in the league. His 3 point attempts also dropped back down to 131 this year, as his overall shooting went up to 48%. He would have a healthy year by his standards, as he played and started in 71 games, while 7 of the games he missed were due to a collapsed lung, suffered after a hard foul from Andrew Bynum in late January. He would still lead the team in scoring and steals, and finish second in rebounding, and he would also have 60 games in double figures and 20 double doubles. The Bobcats had the worst ranked scoring offense, but would have their best season to date. However, a 35 and 47 record was still not enough for the postseason. And for the regular season, Wallace finished with averages of 16 and a half points, eight rebounds, one and a half steals, and one block per game. But the 2010 season would be historic for the Charlotte Bobcats. During the offseason, they sent Okafor to New Orleans for Tyson Chandler. Unfortunately, Chandler would have a disappointing year, as a stress fracture in his foot limited him to just 51 games and 27 starts. But then, after a 3-7 start to the year, the Bobcats sent a package to the Warriors for swingman Steven Jackson on November 16th, and this would prove to be one of the best moves in the brief history of the Bobcats. Wallace and Jackson would form a tough duo who didn't back down to anyone. Wallace would play a career-high 76 games, as he and Jackson combined for nearly 40 points per game. Wallace would hit double figures in 68 games and have 7 games with at least 30, but he would also record a career-high 33 double-doubles. As with Okafor gone and Chandler injured, Wallace became the team's leading rebounder, as he pulled down a career-high 10 per game, and would record a career-high 20 rebounds on two separate occasions, as he was a top 10 rebounder in the league and the shortest member of the top 10. And Wallace was a workhorse, as his 41 minutes per game was second in the league, but he showed that he was an elite two-way player, as he was top 15 in the league in steals per game, and averaged over a block per game as well, while also finishing with the third best defensive rating in the league, as he was voted first team all defense, while even finishing third in defensive player of the year voting. He would earn his first and only all-star selection, and would participate in the dunk contest, but he couldn't replicate his 0-2 performance. But the bigger news was that the Bobcats finished with the first winning record in franchise history, and their 44-38 finish would be enough to earn the franchise its first playoff berth. They entered the playoffs as a 7 seed versus the two-seeded defending Eastern Conference champion Magic, but the series would end in a Magic sweep of Charlotte. Wallace had an incredible start to the series with 25 points and a postseason career high of 17 rebounds on over 61% shooting, but he would then average just 15 points and about 6 rebounds on less than 42% shooting over the next 3 games. However, he would still lead the team in steals and blocks at about 1.5 per game in each category. So although Charlotte's postseason was over, their overall season was still a success, and the regular season saw Wallace average about 18 points, 10 rebounds, 1.5 steals, and a block per game. The duo of Wallace and Jackson was back going into 2011, but Chandler had been traded to Dallas in the offseason. The team started slow, and Brown stepped down after a 9-10 start, and was replaced by Paul Silas. Although Wallace and Jackson continued as the team's top two players, their numbers were down from the year before, as Wallace was putting up his lowest field goal percentage, as well as lowest steal and block numbers since his arrival in Charlotte. But the franchise's first star would end his 2011 season with a different franchise. On February 24th, Wallace was traded to the 32 and 25 Portland Trail Blazers, after Blazers star Brandon Roy required knee surgery, which would keep him out for an extended period of time. Wallace was acquired to keep the Blazers competitive until Roy hopefully returned healthy, and Wallace put up improved numbers in Portland, as in the 23 games he played, he put up about 16 points and 7.5 rebounds on nearly 50% shooting, and had upped his steal numbers to 2 per game. The acquisition of Wallace helped the team go 16-9 the rest of the way to finish at 48-34, as they would enter the playoffs with a first round matchup versus Dallas. Although Dallas would win in 6 games, this series is most memorable for Brandon Roy's incredible 24 point performance to lead a Blazers comeback in Game 4. However, Wallace had a good series. For the series, he would finish 2nd on the team in scoring and 1st in rebounds, while averaging over a steal per game. 
He would record double-digit rebounds in games 3 and 4, and would have his best game in game 6, when he dropped a postseason career high of 32 points to go along with 12 rebounds on 10 of 17 shooting. And for his whole regular season, Wallace averaged about 15.5 points, 8 rebounds, 1.5 steals, and a block per game. Wallace remained a Blazer to begin the lockout shortened 2012 season, but this would be one to forget for Blazers fans. After the lockout, Roy announced his premature retirement due to his knee problems. Wallace would put together a solid year, but he was also putting up some of his lowest numbers since he left Sacramento. But in his defense, the Blazers had a lot of capable players and a lot of younger players who they were looking to get involved. And with Roy done, they needed to begin a bit of a rebuild and a 29-year-old Wallace would be the odd one out. After a decent 20-23 and 23 start, head coach Nate McMillan was fired by interim GM Chad Buchanan as Caleb Canales took over and the Blazers began making a series of bold moves, with none more bold than their March 15th trade of Wallace to New Jersey. The Blazers would receive a package most famous for including the pick that would eventually become Damian Lillard, as Wallace went to a struggling Nets team who had acquired star point guard Darren Williams the season prior and were looking for someone to pair with him. They hoped Wallace could be that guy, and while Wallace played solid, putting up about 15 points and 7 rebounds the rest of the year, he would injure his leg on a putback dunk in April, which would eventually end his season a few days later, as he appeared in 16 games for a 22-44 Nets team who missed the playoffs. And for his regular season overall, Wallace put up 14 points, 6.5 rebounds, and 1.5 steals per game. Wallace would re-sign with the now Brooklyn Nets for 4 more years going into 2013, and the Nets had acquired the Hawks' Joe Johnson, and looked to have a formidable team with the duo of Williams and Johnson alongside Wallace and center Brooke Lopez, but this season would be a disaster for Wallace. He would start the year by injuring his ankle just seconds into the season opener, and overall would miss 13 games due to injury, but this would be the worst season of his career as a starter, as he put up his lowest points and rebounds on the second lowest field goal percentage of his career. The Nets were quite dysfunctional for the first half of the season, and Wallace was not happy, as he would voice heavy criticism of the team after a January 31st blowout loss to Miami, as Wallace voiced his displeasure on virtually every aspect of the team. Head coach Avery Johnson was replaced with PJ Carlissimo about a third of the way into the year, yet with Carlissimo, the team would play well and overall would finish at 49-33 and, and get a first round matchup with Chicago. Unfortunately, the Nets would lose in 7 games. Wallace would play poorly in games 2 and 3, but was great the rest of the series. He would have at least 12 points in each of the other 5 games, while shooting at least 50% in 4 of them, while averaging over a steal per game for the series. But it would be another first round exit for Wallace, and his regular season would see him put up about 7.5 points, 4.5 rebounds, and 1.5 steals per game. During the offseason, Wallace was included in the infamous Nets-Celtics trade, which saw Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett, and Jason Terry go to Brooklyn, as the Nets sent over a massive package. And on top of Wallace, Included in this package were the picks that eventually turned into Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. Unfortunately, Wallace's time in Boston would be riddled with injuries. After trading away a lot of their core, the Celtics were left with young guys like Jeff Green and Avery Bradley, as well as longtime point guard Rajon Rondo. However, Rondo would only manage 30 games this year, but Wallace wouldn't be able to put together a full season either. Overall, these Celtics were littered with injuries, but Wallace would be having a relatively healthy year, primarily coming off the bench. And although his production was limited, he was still efficient, shooting over 50% from the field. But a torn meniscus suffered by Wallace on February 26th cut his year short. Yet the Celtics weren't going to turn any heads this year, as they finished 25-57 and, and missed the playoffs. And for the regular season, Wallace put up about 5 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 1.5 steals per game. Gerald Wallace remained on the Celtics going into 2015, but much like his first years in the league, his final year would be spent buried on the bench as he would appear in just 32 games, getting about 9 minutes per game, and putting up minimal contributions. The Celtics would be healthier this year, and would finish at 40-42, and 42, which would be enough for a first round matchup versus Cleveland, however they would be swept. Wallace would only appear briefly in Game 4, as his final NBA game saw him record 1 rebound, and his regular season saw him average about 1 point, 2 rebounds, and half a steal per game. Wallace would be traded multiple times in the offseason, and eventually was waived by the Sixers, as he would never play in the NBA again, but Gerald Wallace made the most of what he had to have a successful NBA career. He wasn't going to be an elite scorer or the league's most popular player, but he did everything well and was a player you couldn't help but cheer for. 
He played the game with passion whether he was winning or losing, and unfortunately his best years were spent mostly losing. He gave the expansion Charlotte Bobcats a face, and was one of the main reasons for their first playoff appearance. He was known for his defense and hustle, but could still fill it up on the offensive end. He was a player whose game worked when he came in the league, but as the league evolved, a player of his size who lacked a consistent outside shooting touch became less and less valuable. And that reason, plus years on a bad small market team, has led to him becoming one of the more underappreciated players of the 21st century. But if one thing was certain, it was that Gerald Wallace had many ways to impact the game, and he would use at least one of them to make a mark on each and every game he played in. But that's it for today's episode on Gerald Wallace. Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you like this one, check out this one on the player he teamed with to lead Charlotte to the playoffs. Or this one on one of his early teammates in Sacramento. Thanks for watching and see you next time.